Connor, you're very welcome to another episode of Kickoff Sessions. As I said before we started recording, I've been always really interested in ultra marathon runners for the last couple of years. And I think that my entry point into it was David Goggins, which I know you're a fan of as well. And uh, that's where I got my first kind of step into the door. And then seeing people like yourself, seeing people like Shane Finn, uh, who was on my show before as well, have like awesome stories, have really good experience. I think I've got so much learning outcomes from the physical side of sport that they brought into other aspects of their life. So that's why I want to meet up today, get into some of the detail and see uh, see where we go. Yeah, no, I'm delighted to be here, man. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. So like before we get into some of the detail, you'll give a small background as to like how you kind of got into ultra marathon running because it's a pretty pretty niche area not many people are doing something similar like that you know and uh where did it all come from really um i completely fell into it had no real idea that i was ever going to do anything like this whatsoever um i had toy boxed for about six or seven years um from like my late teens into my early 20s i fell off of that um kind of about 22 23 um, had some bad setbacks in my life and within the sport itself and just kind of lost kind of traction in my whole life really more so than just boxing and that that was when I really kind of left it behind lost the passion for it and spent a couple of years doing the usual 20s thing just working a lot drinking a lot um, you know, kind of really had a, you know, what I call the wilderness years, even though I spend more time in the, in the actual wilderness now, but <laughs> that was what I call the wilderness years because you don't get a compass or a map to kind of help you through that part of life. Um, just felt like I didn't have much direction. And in 2018, I was like, you know what, I, I, I'd love to be a, a, I'd love to be an athlete again. You know, I'd love to just like compete at something again, whether it's mm -hmm. against myself or when, whether it's against other people. And um, so I started training for the Cork City Marathon, did, did that, kind of half drank, half trained myself to the start line of that, finished it, and then got uh, kind of basically was sitting down with my buddy one day, and you were saying there before we got on that you had gotten interested in David Goggins. We got interested in David Goggins. We were all about him, you know. You, you know, we, could, we, we were David, uh, David Goggins accolades, like, you know, and we were like, you know, really into his story. And we kind of said to ourselves, you know what, like, I'd love to do something like what he was doing. I said, let's, let's run a hundred miles. Like, let's do a hundred mile run. And my buddy looked up for, for a hundred mile run that was taking place in Ireland. And there was the, you know, the Connemara 100 mile ultra marathon. And we went and seven weeks later, we were up in Connemara at the, you know, Connemara 100 miler. And 28 hours later, we, I crossed the line and, um, I suppose that was when my, you know, relationship with ultramarathon kind of, you know, was started in a way, but in, in also in a way, you know, I don't think I was actually in the proper headspace at the time to even properly take in what had happened or, you know, what it actually takes for you to be, uh, to, to, to do an ultramarathon, you know what I mean? To go, and to like, go ultra even, essentially. You know, yeah, it was like, you know, it was like one of those things where it's like, that's bucket list, you know, tick the box, run an ultra marathon kind of thing. Not the way I actually thought about it. I left it thinking I'd never run another ultra marathon again. Um, and then it, it just so happened that I would, you know. And not just you would, you go, you go on to do multiple different events. But I think what was really cool there is you hit on many, struck in different chords that a lot of people do that are my age, 23, 24, 25, is that when you're leaving university or when you're doing anything, there's just fuck all direction in the beginning when we're young, you know? We're so easily, you know, guided by other people's like decisions, what the other paths were, and we ultimately have no idea what we're doing. So things like David Goggins, and for anyone who doesn't know, you know, he went through a very difficult childhood, went through a very difficult upbringing, and he found a lot of, his kind of like relief through like physical exercise and trying to, you know, own something part, one part of his life. Cause you know, he worked kind of shitty jobs, but he knew he was like standing up for himself and getting to that kind of ownership of his marathon running and, you know, all different elements trying to get into the Navy SEALs. So I think that's a really cool, like interesting kind of like parallel because people like myself, when they're, when they're quite young, it's so easy to get caught up in other people and have very little direction of what do I do next? Yeah, that's, I think that that's uh, like, that's been here since the dawn of time, 
like p- people get to a certain point in their lives i think we know it no more so than ever because there is so much choice sometimes it's actually crippling like there are so many different paths you, you you if you take a path one path you feel like you're 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 negating 30 paths do you get me whereas like before you know many people had one or two possible choices of things that they were going to do at that time and like may, maybe there was a crossroads there of you know whether they go to work or whether they actually even finish secondary school that was like that was one of the big ones especially with my parents and things you know their generation and even the gener- you know even 10 or 15 years after that it was like i don't know if my family can afford to keep me in secondary school i might actually have to start working right yeah. and so that was a big choice for them to make at the time now we find ourselves in a situation where it's not it's not as if it's any better a situation i don't know if it's better or worse or whatever because like there is you know having to leave secondary school and not get that education and go into work there are so many downsides to that but there's also kind of a thing of you know where it's giving you a bit of purpose and a bit of meaning within your life that you're taking care of your family in that way and then you come come to you know the you know 2021 you've got so many different choices that you know it's things can become purposeless and meaningless very very quickly and you know you feel like oh if you if you hop on this train you're losing out on the opportunity to hop on so many others so that's that's a big thing i think that people find anxiety about is what do i what possible path do i pick and what i can say to anybody in that situation is is like i'm 30 years old and really don't know what track i'm even on you know it's like I don't know if there's a you know a definite defined path for me to take within in my day to day and you know I simplified my wants and desires in life very very early um not not very 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 late sorry like you know so so I I I was very like you know wanted the normal things of having a car and house and family and all this kind of stuff and then I kind of realized Do you know what that might be bullshit and I might not actually want to work you know fucking six days a week and i might not want to you know not have a have a life outside of working and drinking you know what i'm saying so you know i think it's very much uh, people find themselves in the position where they're they are crippled by how much choice they have and then they're constantly second guessing themselves on whether they've made the right choice or not 100% 100% man as in like the fear of missing out is just so fucking big it's like you leave university or any aspects of your life you know you could be in company x you could be in a startup you could have your own company you could have no company and you could be traveling the world so there's always that kind of parallel and it's like you're on social media you're looking at someone else you're feeling that kind of pressure and anxiety and therefore you think your path is actually incorrect whereas just like you said there you simplify you find something that suits you for now or for the next year or two and then you just try to kind of own it is, is what I've been kind of like working towards. And especially I think with you, because you set these targets that are fucking astronomical, like in anyone's books, like doesn't matter who you are, even if, even if you are an ultra marathon runner, like 200 miler for that is, is crazy. Like you did it in 59 hours, 45 minutes, I think it was, I read, I read actually this morning, mm-hmm. like it doesn't matter the time. It's just the, the feet. But I think what was really cool there is the fact that you set those targets and you're like, okay, this is what I'm doing now. And that's what I've tried to do really is like, it doesn't matter what the goal is, but I guess set a goal and then I'm going to work towards it for X amount of time. And then we make it a bit of a move. Whereas it can be easy to just go through your twenties and have absolutely no idea what's going on. You know, you're, you got into a role because you wanted to, you're, you know, you have a job, you're in a relationship that you don't necessarily want to be in. And now you don't have any direction. And that's where we, maybe you might get into the issues of being unfulfilled. And you, when you say meaning and purpose, I always refer back to man's search for meaning. Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankl. Mm-hmm. Fantastic book. But uh, that was a big turning point for me. And I think there's a lot of similarities in, in what you're doing even. I, I'm going to throw an old spanner in the works here now of what you just said there of uh, of um, like the, of Man's Search for Meaning, right? Is what Man's Search for Meaning shows us or showed me or what, what the idea of meaning um, is, is it's whatever lie you want to tell yourself, right? Because... Like life is actually, if you, my, my life, Conor O'Keefe, it is actually meaningless, right? Like, no, like I'm going to be dust 
you know, I'm going to die one of these days and I will go back into the earth and like, you know, hundreds of years from now, my name will be forgotten, right? But so, and that can lead you, lead a lot of people. It does lead a lot of people into nihilistic thoughts, into thinking that life is absolutely, because life is meaningless, I'm, I'm not going to do anything, right? But what Viktor Frankl posits in that book is, yes, life is meaningless, but if we decide that it actually is meaningless and we act as so, we're just going to suffer through a life that we have to live. We're going to actually, we're going to suffer. And if we don't find a way of attaching meaning to that life and attaching some sort of meaning to a life that, you know, doesn't it's just about surviving you know what i mean really you know if we can attach meaning to it then it reduces our suffering and um jordan peterson touches on this as well right where he talks about order and chaos right and i know that when i don't have you know a meaning attached to something or if i don't have something to you know that I'm kind of working towards, or I feel like I'm in a bit of a rut. That's like, I feel like I'm chaotic. I feel like my life is just like, you know, it's, it, it's a, it's on a plateau. It's not going yeah. anywhere or whatever, you know? Yeah. Whereas when we, when we take a step into order, when we put more, you know, effort into our day to day and we put more effort into our, you know, into achieving what goals we want to do, then we're in order and that reduces our suffering. You know, Carl Jung says to live is to suffer and to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. So like a lot of people will suffer because, you know, they are leaning their lives more into the chaotic side of things and they haven't found a way of like, you know, creating some semblance of order within their lives. And I find order through doing the, you know, the, I suppose monstrous tasks, you know, and, and, and doing these these ultra marathon feats. That's my meaning. You know, no one cares. No, no one actually really cares whether I ever run another five kilometers again. Only me. And so I have to attach that meaning to that. And that's what that's what really Viktor Frankl was getting at, is that yeah, you can decide that nothing means anything and you can suffer your whole life. Mm -hmm. Or you can actually attach a meaning to something and find beauty and meaning within that life for you. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, I think yeah, that's it, what he was kind of getting. getting at, it, but it, but it, but it's all, but it's also no, the, the kind of parallel there you said between order and chaos, even from a Victor, Fra Fra Victor Frankl's perspective, because with Jordan, Pe Jordan Peterson's approach is like, when you have all that order and you have none of the chaos, it's like you're sitting back on your laurels and that's when you're doing, fuck all you're sitting on your ass not mm. doing anything because like yeah you need to have a bit zone. of both you need you need exactly you have that comfort zone whereas like if you're going into different aspects of your life and you're starting new projects or new work or new relationships that's when things are absolutely chaotic and when you're able to get a sense of organization there and a bit of management on it that's where you get a lot of actually enjoyment from it so the last piece there mm. is like having fulfillment but also actually enjoying what you're doing and it's kind of like when you yes. have that kind of like inflection point where it's like something mm -hmm. is shit. I don't know a lot about it. I want to get better at it. It's like learning a skill. You know, it's like when you started running like ex extreme distances, like you broke through those thresholds. And I think ultra marathon running is a perfect example. Like the furthest I've actually ever ran was 30K trying to veer, gear up for a marathon, but COVID hit, marathon got canceled. However, I still look back on that like 30K because 30K to me, I was able to split it up into several different ways and then be able to segment it through my own kind of brain. So even if it is the first five, the next five, and then seeing that progress, it's it, the outcome is linear because you can see that, okay, I did X and Y, but I think the path mm -hmm. then becomes so fucking difficult. And in between you have hills and whatnot, but I thought that was a really good example. Like it was a lot of symbolism for me because I could see the output for my input. And that's where in mm -hmm. life, you don't actually have that a lot. Like, you know, even like podcasting, you see downloads go up, you see downloads go down. You don't necessarily know it's getting better, but it's hard to, there's not as much metrics is what I'm getting at. Um, but physical exercise often can provide that information sometimes. 
Absolutely. I suppose like, you know, we have made our lives quite easy, you know, um, through, you know, through technological advances, through, you know, cultural and societal advances. So like, you know, injecting that bit of, bit of, you know, strain and, and a bit of that kind of, uh, you know, the physical activity side of things that does, it does, you know, help with that, with um, creating that kind of you know, I suppose it's like struggle. We need struggle. You know, if we don't, then if we don't have struggle and we don't have that, um, a bit, you know, that that fight within us, it can be very, very hard to, you know, to find to find that meaning side of it. Like, so I think that's what people, why people get such, uh, so much from, let's say, training for a marathon or doing anything, you know, tra- or like you know, training for let's say GAA or hurling or whatever the case may be, and like, you know playing matches and trying to win championships and all that kind of stuff. But it's also another reason why I think people fall off so much. Like mm. people do the marathon, same as me. I did the marathon and completely fell off. You know what I mean? I started, I drank for like three days afterwards, you know, and it was like, I think that, you know, more so than trying to look outwardly for this physical thing to save us, which I was trying to do for years, like including basically all of my tie boxing career i i think that we should try and be looking look inwards and kind of think okay well like you know who, you know who am i you know that's the question that uh you know um and and indeed victor frankel um would have used is who am i and that's taken from more like zen buddhist type approaches to like to, to meaning is and and you know asking that question of who am i it's like am i connor the ultra marathon runner. Yeah, it's an easy way of like people knowing who I am. But like, would I be okay without it? You know, would I be yeah. okay to live without these things? You know, yeah. it's like, that's that's the even bigger question. Like, you know, so I think if people are struggling with, you know, people, let's say that are listening to this are struggling with kind of like, where is my life going? You know, you know tr- like trying to figure out who you are is going to be one of the most who you are a lot of the times will help you will kind of dictate what you're doing so like you know it's it's about figuring that out first before we start stressing out about what we should or shouldn't be doing you know 100 percent, man i I laugh there because what i always think about as well is i was actually thinking about a a post recently and this was about like if we remove titles if we took away all titles Mm. for jobs for sport for accomplishment would you still be doing what you're doing right now so mm-hmm. like, for example, you with the first marathon, me with bodybuilding, so my kind of background was in bodybuilding. Uh, it was the most painful eight weeks of my life, like 100% down. It literally screwed me up so heavily. And afterwards was even worse because of the fact that I had that blowback, the initial blowback. But the whole idea was I was trying to get to the end to almost say that I did it. And like, that's like a, yes. you know, it's, it's, it's pretty bad to look back on now in terms of like my ego, like 21 years old, but it was like to say that I had done this. But I just think like if I was, if I genuinely removed all titles, would I still be even doing all this stuff? And fundamentally, I think the answer is no. I think that I would do things that just pulls towards enjoyment, um, probably creativity as well, because you kind of like that kind of creative Mm. aspect and maybe something that just brings more of like a community aspect. That's genuinely honest truth. If if you, but that's if you were to remove money as well, to be fair. But I think that's a good Mm. way to look at it is like, take off the title. Are you still waking up in the morning and going to that same job, you know? Yeah, man, you, you raise a very interesting point. Like the thing is, you know, this is actually, you know, I, I, honestly, um, like I'm just going to, I'm going to have a little sidebar here for this, right? Like I, I like, like, you know, this is really great because this is a conversation that has really nothing to do with me being in pain during ultramarathons, which is great because <laughs> like that's only a tiny part of like the last three years like a lot of the part has been thinking about this type of stuff but you're dead fucking right man like like no one like the thing is right if the prestige and money of being a doctor wasn't there right Mm -hmm. if being a doctor was like be was like you know being somebody who be be, let's say a, a very another job that's very very that's very important but people don't put as much importance on it let's say you're a carpenter right Mm -hmm. Look, you're a carpenter and you're a doctor and you're held in the same regard by society and you're paid the same. 
Do you go to college for eight years? Do you put that slog in for what you actually claim you're doing it for? When you ask people why they're doctors, it's because they want to help people and it's because they want to heal people, right? Mm -hmm. Very true. If we took away the money and the prestige, I don't know how many doctors we'd have left. That's what I'm, that's a, something that I, you know, I'll put it out there and, and people can disagree with me, right? Because there are very, very, there's a lot of altruistic people who give up their time for people as well. Really appreciate that. And there are an awful lot of doctors that have completely shunned that part of life and are working charitably and all of these things. So, and, and I never judge people on how they want to fucking live their lives. Doctors are incredibly admirable and hardworking people, not taking that away from them. But it's just, that's just one a universal that people can understand, right? But you put that into the sporting side of things, right? And I, I can, I'll put my fucking hand up right here in this. If I wasn't able to share my first marathon and indeed my first ultra marathon on Instagram and have like everybody kind of think, fuck, that's class. That's really cool. Pat on the back. Fuck no, what I done it. Fuck no, what I had done it because I was doing it for other people. I was doing it for other people, and like I that and that's something that I just I I definitely had. I was a pleaser, like you know, and I wanted to be accepted and and have friends from when I was a young fella. You know what I mean? I found it like it's weird when when you're in your adult life and you don't really care about you know uh, care as much about people what people think about you. You end up making friends actually a lot quicker but when you're when you're a young fella and you're constantly thinking about how you should act and what you should do and like trying to please people i think people can actually there's a subtle way of people seeing that you know what i mean but of course like i think that followed me up through life and i i, I definitely started thai boxing and was fighting in thai boxing a lot of the times because it gave this kind of prestige it gave this tough guy image this guy that comes in and starts elbowing people into the head and kneeing people into the ribs and taking <laughs> kicks and all this kind of stuff it it brought this title with it you know and this kind of you know it, all the entrapments that come with it if that didn't come with it if i was f fighting someone the exact same right and i was fighting them in some back room and there was three people there and there was no recordings of it or whatever the case be I don't think it would have had the same appeal to me. And, I, and this is just being honest. Like a lot of people won't say these things to you because they'll just be like, yeah, I did it because I love it. Yeah, you you did love it, but you love everything that comes with it as well, I would imagine. Now there's also, again, there's going to be exceptions to this as well, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when I decided to start training for the 200 miler, right? The reason why, right? So I started training for a 200 miler. Really another another thing of like looking externally for how I was going to make sense of my life, right? Looking externally and kind of thinking, Do you know what? People would probably think this is cool. That's how it kind of, how, how it all kind of started really. Like, you know, mm -hmm. breaking it down into its simplest form. And then I started training for it. And when I started to train for it, I fucking realized there's no one else fucking here. For four months, there's nobody fucking looking at you. There's nobody here. It's five o'clock in the morning and you're out in the pissing fucking wind in February. There's no one fucking here but you, Connor. So you better fucking ask yourself why you're doing this. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you fucking... And the bigger question of why are you here comes into it. Johnny, why are you here? Why are you doing this right now? And when I started to ask myself that fucking question, that's when things started to change for me, right? And so after my marathon and after my um, and after my first ultra marathon, both of those times I completely fell off the wagon, right? After my first ultra marathon, my first hundred mile run, I drank for the for like for there was four months of my heaviest drinking of my adult life, right? Of my whole life, really, you know. So like it was and, and then I decided I'd start training for the 200 miler, right? And so I finished the 200 miler. I ended up winning it. I didn't like expect that to happen. I didn't expect to do so well or whatever, you know, objectively well. And so when I finished it, right, one of the my, my favorite moments was like not even crossing the line. Crossing the line was a beautiful moment and I was there to share it with my father and all this was brilliant. The, my favorite moment really from that was the day afterwards. I was sitting down with my, my father and he put his hand on my lap as we were sitting down for dinner. And he looked over at me, he didn't say anything to me. And I looked over back at him and I said, I don't feel any different. And it's like, 
that was, and not in a bad way, in a very good way. It was like I wasn't seeking any type of approval from this 200 miler. And so that allowed me to continue, you know, that allowed me to keep going because I wasn't looking for something from it and which never, ever lives up to the expectation, by the way. You never, ever, like, you're like, oh, yeah. Like when I was tie box and I wanted to win an Irish title, right? I never got to that. I like got, I actually got knocked unconscious in the last round, in the last minute of an Irish title fight, right? So I, that was one of the things that really sucked me out of the sport. But like, if I had won that Irish title fight, right? I would, I actually thought at the time that would make my life, right? I was 20 fucking three or 22, right? 22. And I thought my whole fucking life's going to be made. Sure, like hopefully I'd have another 65 plus years of life. You know what I mean? But like, mm. I thought my life be made because I won the title. And it never lives up to that expectation. And that's why I always used to drop off after every fight I won, I would drop off. My mood would drop. Like my sense of purpose would drop everything because I wasn't doing it like from, for myself, for my own, like as an expression, as a, as a physical expression of how I was feeling, I wasn't actually, you know, know, it was that, that was, that had become your identity. Absolutely. And you were, Absolutely. you were literally known as the perfect, like you want to be known as the kickboxer. And that is baked into man, into every fucking fighter that's out there. All UFC fighters, all, well, UFC so recent, it's mainly boxing. You see boxers that are everything and then they finish and then it's completely gone. They go off the fucking rails, you know, everything they're doing, drugs, drink, the whole lot. And I think as you described there was the ante- anticipation is often better than the outcome. And we don't, we don't realize that, you know, we don't realize that. And then you go back into that feedback loop of what am I doing? Why wasn't doing something else? I'm getting depressed. I'm not on the right path because I've been putting so much pressure on myself to deliver that I don't, I don't, I've lost all sight of the goal. And I think that's when it becomes something that's not sustainable. And it's just, it's, it's a horrible rut to be in. I think really like when you're building something for the future or working towards something in the future, it's like, setting those realistic expectations that I don't want to go off the fucking rails, man. I don't want it all at the very end of the day because you have actually gone on to do all the things that you would have taught in the beginning is what you wanted to do. You know, you're going on to run these huge races and whatnot. And it's as if you weren't putting the focus on it and it's happened indirectly instead of falling off the rails saying, you know, finishing out at a semi-decent athlete, doing a couple of marathons Mm. here or there. You've been able to scale because you took away the ego, which is another fucking big part. And I think that's what's really hit me hard. So one actually personal account on that is that I started like a clothing company a couple of years ago and uh, it was good. It was, it was fun. And I made a bit of cash from it, but I, f- I absolutely enjoy talking about it more than actually doing the work. And when I got mm-hmm. into the weeds of doing it, man, that's when like all hit, shit hit the fan in terms of like, is this what I actually want to do? You know? Flip, flip the switch now, what I'm kind of more gearing towards is looking at building a sustainable business that is really just for me and really just tailored for me so that I don't have to deal with all the other bullshits in life. You know, the fear of going through interviews, the fear of doing this, the fear of my things not working out, the fear of not having enough money uh, to provide mm-hmm. stuff. So it's a longer term vision, of course. But I think when I get down to it, I hope hopefully I won't find myself in a nightclub just talking about trying to start a business versus actually going and executing it, you know? It's like, you know, enjoying talking about 200 miles, but not enjoying getting up at five o'clock <laughs> in the wind and the piss and shite of February. It's like, you know, you know, Jay-Z actually said this. Um, in, I'm a huge Jay-Z fan, like, of his music, but, like, you know, he has really good nuggets for business as well. And he, he said a little snippet in an interview recently that people want to mimic the outcome but they don't want to mimic the process. And that's another thing, like things are so, like people lean towards what is expedient right now. They lean towards what's a quick, quick gratification. And like, they don't see, like with you with the clothing company or whatever, and you're talking, you're there, you know, chatting shit over fucking gin and tonics inside the nightclub or whatever the case be. I've been there myself as well, chatting shit about all types of stuff that I'm so great and I did this, that and the other. Like, you know, when you're there, like the you know, when you're talking about that, are you as willing to be getting up at fucking six o'clock in the morning to make sure you're answering the right emails and you're paying people out or you're sending invoices out to this person and all that kind of shit? 
Probably not. Like, and 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 that's and that's a really you know for yourself now at your age, right? For you to be kind of thinking, you know, yeah, do you know what I I like talk, talking about it more than I liked actually, you know, doing the fucking nitty gritty is incredibly honest, and that's another thing. It's like when I started, when I had those epiphanal moments, when I'm running that fucking at, in February at five in the morning and I realized that you're the only one fucking here training for this thing. There's no one looking at you. I kind of realized that, yeah, it's my responsibility and it's my, you know, I'm the one who's going to actually have to take control and stop blaming other people for my life. Mm-hmm. And that's a great thing that like, you know, for you to be that honest with yourself about what you're doing, you learn a fantastic lesson there. You know what I mean? Like I, I definitely learned a lesson very, very similar to that of like, I really just liked, you know, I la- liked, I liked telling people that I was a fighter, you know, and I liked telling people I've got a title fight coming up. I, you know, I, I liked telling people that and Jesus, I was like, I really liked the nitty gritty as well. Actually, I liked training hard, but I think I like training hard because I knew that there would be kudos at the end of it for me. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah. that's that's at the lower sub-sub level. That's the side of us we don't want to look at. We don't want to look at that side in the mirror because the side that's way more better is that I just love, you know, getting in and fighting people. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's the more, that's the part that sells tickets. Mm-hmm. You know, 100%. if somebody was coming out to, you know, if that was some guy, you know, in a press conference and he goes, yeah, I'm actually doing this because I actually enjoy just being liked, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no one's, no one's going to watch this dude fight. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, if, if he 100%. goes, yeah, I do it because it's in my blood, you know, like that, that's the type of shit that that's the person that's far easier to look at in the mirror. And for you to get to that point with, with that, I think, you know, it's like, that was the, that was the point that I, I got to about. You know, my first marathon and my first hundred miler was like, stop doing these things for other people, Connor, you idiot. Yeah. Like do them for fucking you because you'll never be able to continue it if it's not for you. And so when you're looking at your your business, right? And your business and your sustainable business ideas, like you're you're thinking about the, the no titles and all these kind of things, right? So you'll probably start a business that allows you to live the life of kind of more community-based, like, like, uh, you know, that's a, an eth- that's an ethical pillar in which you like and you enjoy. I'm going to have an aspect to, to it. Uh, I'm going to do something that I just actually fucking enjoy. You know, when I get enjoyment out of Grant, boom, I tick that box as well. And that's, that's what we receive from that level of honesty is we cut the bullshit out and we kind of go, you know what? I don't really want to make fucking you know, leather handbags or I don't want to make t-shirts yeah. or I don't want to make those fucking things. I want to actually do this and I don't care necessarily. Like the thing is, right, the less you care about, it's like the less you care about what people think about you, the more friends you'll get and the less people, the less time you think about money, the more money you'll get. And I mean it like, and that's, I never thought about money throughout the whole time. And I, and there was times when I really struggled, uh, you know, at times really, really lucky that I was living with my parents for a good lot of it to kind of, you know, they helped me in that way to discover it. And I think we've gotten to the point now as well in our lives where we feel bad for that, feel bad as like, oh, I'm living at home and we feel bad for it. But I'm like, okay, right. Flat, fa- fast forward 30 years and you've got a 22 or 23 or 24, or 25 year old son or daughter that's living at home with you having a bit of a tough time. Would you like to be able to, you know, help them in that way and give them a place to stay, give them a place to live rent free. You would. So like, we need to stop feeling bad if we have any, any bit of a leg up in that way. You know what I mean? We need to just take that move forward and then try and carve our own path. And when you, when, when you let go of those kind of shackles, it gives you an awful lot of freedom in that way, like to, Mm -hmm. you know, to take on whatever you want. But this is like, it's, it is, it is something that I, if I could impart any bit of knowledge, you know, taking you know taking your bat on there of your own honesty within your life is fucking hell just be honest with yourself stop fooling yourself about things and and like and another thing that comes with being honest is you realize that you're in control of the good and the bad that comes in your life you know 100 percent. and i blamed fucking everyone for everything um in my life and so when you start kind of turning these fingers out that are pointing outwards at everyone else back at yourself, you, you, there's a fine line 
you have to be very honest and you have to be compassionate because like, mm-hmm. fuck it, man, we've all made mistakes. You know what I mean? Like you were saying there, you started a business that you really weren't fucking into and you were just more interested in fucking talking shit than actually doing it. There's a lot of times where you you can look back at times like that and go, fuck, I shouldn't have done that. Or that was a mistake. Or Jesus, we failed and you know, blah, blah, blah. All of those kind of st- things. Look back at that and, and show compassion to yourself because at least you're actually facing up to it now and you're aware of it now. You know, and that's where I had to be with, with a lot of my life too. You know, I think the big area there on accountability is just absolutely huge. And I think Goggins is obviously a big uh, guy on that, but the accountability mirror, looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking, you know, am I doing the best that I want to do? You know, it's not about like actually like being the best ultramarathon runner. It's about like if I'm going to take full ownership and accountability of what I'm doing, which is running, let's say, for instance, or starting a company, working your best in your own corporate job. It's taking that ownership that, okay, I've made the right steps or I'm making the most incorrect steps. I think that was pretty cool with your recent event that you got a, uh, did not finish for. And you looked at it and said, you know, I did a couple, good, a couple things right, a couple things wrong, but I'll fix this issue and I'll move on with my life and I'll, I'll make it better and I'll do something mm-hmm. nice. And obviously that's a very like humbling experience for you because you take 100% risk, you take 100% responsibility, you take 100% of everything. And for you to kind of come to that realization is incredibly powerful, you know? And I think that's a, a big thing with me, man. And like, I have tried to drop my ego quite a lot. And like, I would have been quite an egotistical dude to begin with when I was quite younger. But when I'm looking at different ideas now, and I'm looking at different podcasts, for instance, and like, I am trying to scale quite aggressively. And I look at things that are working. And I think, and my first thought was like, you know, like, why is that not working for me? And I kind of had an element of envy and jealousy. And then I took a step back and I said to myself, I was like, okay, I need to look at it from a perspective of, I want to get to that level. What is it that Mm. person is doing? How do I get there? And what is my next immediate task? If I can outline my next immediate task, go and do it to the best of my ability, then I can improve on all the other pillars and just try to elevate. And again, look at a longer time horizon. I'm not looking to, you know, have a quick buck to do this in a day. I'm looking to do this over a longer period of time. And I think a big thing for me was the fact I don't necessarily need the money from things at the moment. Like you said there about how it comes to mm. you quite well. Like luckily enough, I have a good job, very like happy with, with my current um, current role. But I think that has been a big reliever for me because I've started thinking about how can I do things that are for me? I'm going to do things mm. well. How can I plan things? And then the money will inevitably trickle down because you'll be focusing on something as a inverted comma specialist or expert at that time so i think really it was just it's just about becoming more centered with yourself and that seems fucking bizarre because you think it's kind of opposite it's like just going you know the gary v approach to get shit done do as much as possible that stuff doesn't actually work what actually works is yeah. like trying to do things in a practical sense and I don't know, man, it's ongoing. It's going to keep on going. I, I don't imagine it to stop anytime soon. I'm trying to get better over the next couple of years and trying to improve slowly, you know? Um, absolutely. Like what you were saying there about, about failure, right? Like, um, and I use the word failure very, like, you know, it's very matter of factly, like, you know what I mean? Like failure to me, like if I say that I failed at something or I failed something, I failed. It's not, that's, it's not like, oh, geez, I, you know, I came up short, you know, failure is okay and we shouldn't talk about it like a dirty word because it's part and parcel of life you know what i mean and you're going to fail at things so like what i what i kind of have you know the the parallel that i draw with like my dnf my did not finish my failure at ultra marathon is like have you ever been part of a team have you ever been in a team sport before right Mm -hmm. you win a game you fucking hammer them right you you beat them into the ground and you finish up the match and everybody is fucking slapping backs and fucking having a laugh and the showers and having the crack and wondering what pub we're going to go to afterwards get a couple of points and all this kind of stuff and everybody is talking about what he did in the game did you see him i picked him up and i nearly threw him into the stands and all this kind of stuff and you're having a laugh and a joke and then the next day you forget about the game forget about the game you're back into the train and all this kind of stuff right mm-hmm. right you get hammered you get hammered and you, you fucking peep. Someone puts 30 points over you, right? And the next, when you finish that game, 
you will be in the next training session looking at the, let's say it's rugby, right? You'll be looking at your scrum. You'll be looking at your line out. You'll be looking at your set plays. You'll be looking at your kicker. How's he kicking? What's the scrum half doing? You know what I mean? How is the, how are the front row operating? You will be looking at every single facet and aspect of that game to gain that 1% in each of those areas. And that's what Mercedes did in Formula One. And that's why they're fucking running the show at the moment. It's because they looked at that. They looked at every single facet of the car, every single facet of the driver, every single facet of the team. And all they were looking for was that 1% improvement along the way. And how did they do that? They lost races. They lost championships. They, did, they, they didn't fucking win overnight. Do you know what I mean? It was, it, it was constantly looking for failure is what got them success. Because if they fail, it, it's more knowledge. It's more it like and what what came from my um, my failure in that ultra marathon came one question, and it's a question that I've been asking myself almost every day since. And that is, what are your standards? What are my standards for myself during the day? What are my standards? Are my standards not warming up properly before I you know do my workout or I do my run? Are my standards? you know, jump, finishing up a fucking absolute ball busting run and not cooling down and not stretching and not hydrating properly and not eating properly. Are they my standards? No, they're not. So why the fuck are you doing them, Connor? You know, that's that's how how honest I had to be with myself at the end of that of that race was I wasn't doing the simple shit right. Yeah, I was given a hundred percent in training. Yes, you could you could say that. But I actually kind of wasn't because training is everything. It's not just the activity. It's are you warming up? Are you cooling down? Are you looking after your hydration? Are you getting your nutrition in order? Are you sleeping enough? All of these things are like, I'm like, what are your standards? Are your standards down here? Are they dog shit? Or are they up here? Where do they want to be? And where are you happy with them? And so ask myself that question on a kind of like a more repetitive way. Like if I ever find myself falling short of something, and I, like if I'm, you know, doing my like, I'm doing rehab at the moment because the reason why I had to DNF is because I got, I got, I have acute sciatica, right? So I basically, I, I, you know, it's just nerve damage or nerve uh, pain from my back all the way down to the back of my knee. And so um, I'm doing rehab for that. Rehab's boring as fuck. It's the worst thing ever. Rehab <laughs> exercises are shite, like, you know what I mean? But I'm just, I'm almost like gamifying it with myself. I'm like making it into this kind of a thing where like I'll finish and like I when while I'm doing it, I'm always asking myself like, what are your standards? What are your fucking standards? It's a very powerful thing because I'm a big believer in mantras anyway. But like, what are your standards? Are you and it keeps it fucking high, like it keeps the the quality of the reps the amount of reps, the time, the break time I'm taking between sets, it keeps all of that in line because I'm constantly thinking, okay, I'm doing these things in light of my standards. You know what I mean? And I wouldn't have gotten to there and I would not have gotten to that point without that failure. If I had crossed the line, right? Nothing would have happened and I crossed the fucking line, I finished the race. I wouldn't be looking at my fucking life scene where I'm going to be able to improve. And like, it even trickled out into things that have nothing to do with running. My car was a fucking mess. I hopped into my car after the ultra marathon and my car was a fucking disgrace. It's spotless now. Has been all the time. Spotless. I have a van outside. Spotless. I cleaned my motorcycle. Spotless. I, you know, cleaned up around my house. Spotless. My work area. Spotless. And that, that's another thing that would have never happened only for this failure and this fucking run. Because the run for me was like, and I know you're 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 um you're stuck on time here. Now we've we've got a couple of minutes uh, left. That's all right. Don't I, worry. Fuck it. <laughs> I uh, but but the basically the 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 run for me was actually like okay, you, you could look at this two different ways. Oh shit, I got injured. Crap. Or you could go, what the fuck caused the injury? You go know, back it was route. you. You know, what's the route? Yeah, what's the what was your six weeks before this race like? You know what I mean? Forget about the race. Forget about the actual day of the race itself. That's a minute detail, and we'll take what we can from that. But what the fuck were the processes like? And what I found that was I was fitting in training. I wasn't allotting specific times each day for training. I was fitting it in. 
which just shouldn't be the case. And, you know, th- these things, like, you need to give yourself that, that th- those opportunities to fucking fall flat in your face, you know, 100%. because they, they teach you so much. And like, it's the same with you with starting the clothing company or whatever the case may be. Like, you needed that fucking, you know, kick up the hole in that way. Like, and I did as well. And that's how we learn from things. And, you know, we can try and stay as coddled and as soft as we possibly can and never put ourselves in a situation where, you know what, I might actually fail at this. We'll stay in this comfortable job that we don't like, you know, or we'll, you know, stay in this relationship that we don't really want to be in, but we're kind of afraid of what life is like without it, or we'll stay doing whatever, or we'll stay, you know, overweight or we'll stay with this pain in my knee or we'll stay with this such and such or, or whatever and we'll stay inactive and unfit or you know and and not want to live that way but we'll stay there because it's safe and you know we're not going to fail at that we're going to we're quite good at that you know so you know don't be afraid to fail basically what was awesome about that man is the fact that like you get under the fucking microscope with that without like did not fail we did not finish you really looked under the microscope and went back to the root like did a root cause analysis and tracked out that progress what's mm-hmm. almost worse than not starting and failing is not looking back and reflectively looking at what went wrong and that is something that you did really well it's something that a lot of people don't do they fail they blame other people and then at that point then they just say fuck it i'm just going to move on in my life it wasn't meant to be it wasn't the right idea it wasn't the right fit they don't go back and do that retrospective six months, 12 months, 18 months, however long this venture has been, and they don't look at that in isolation and think, what were my breaking points? And essentially, how can I remediate and essentially never let that happen again? And that is what I'm trying to do with my fucking life is like, look at where the cracks are. And there's a lot of them. Like you look under the surface, there's a lot of cracks, man. But if I can start plugging these holes slowly and then build this into my lifestyle, build this into my business, build this into whatever I want to do, relationships, whatnot, this is where I'm actually going to improve because, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting something wrong. That's fucking fine. But if you're going to keep on making that mistake, like fool, fool's on you then if you're getting the same mistake Absolutely. over and over again. And I think looking under the surface, things like this, you know, like maybe like, and you don't even need to be like journaling it. I could be in the gym, man, and I could like look back and I'm thinking about these things and I'm doing things that are like in flow state and kind of this in flow pattern. And then I'm learning things like on the go, you know, I don't necessarily need yeah. need a whiteboard of saying, don't do this, do this. You know, I don't need that to improve necessarily. And the only person that you should be thinking about in terms of the failure is yourself, right? Because like, you know, when I failed at that, I've got a social media presence that probably knows me as this, you know, ultra endurance dude or whatever. And then he, you know, I'm not able to finish this race, right? You're like, you know, I don't give a shit about that. And like what, what I would, what I would, what I would do is I wouldn't expect anybody to unfollow me because of that. Right. Like, you know, I, I actually thought that if I'd ever fall flat on myself in an ultra endurance uh, thing that people would unfollow me in droves. That's actually not what happened. More people followed me actually, which was weird. Right. And I, you know, that's one of those fears, those doubts that you have in your head, you know, as a human being, but I wouldn't expect people to, 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 you know, fucking unfollow me in droves just strictly because of a failure. I would expect every single person in the, uh, that follows me to unfollow me if I just fucking sat on, if I just, just stepped oh. down. <laughs> if I didn't stop, if I didn't, if I just, if I said, oh, Jesus, look, you know, I think that, you know, my time in running is done. Unfollow me unfollow me immediately because that's not like it's if you're talking about taking responsibility that's not taking responsibility for my life so that's why we're doing 32 marathons in in november that's why i'm well like why i am training to do that now like you know so it's mm. it's is to is to kind of it's just for me it's for, for me it's to, it's to say it to myself that i'm not gonna fucking go quietly into the night like you know 100 percent, man 100 percent. i would mm. honestly love to keep on going for four more hours mm. but unfortunately yeah no it's all good man so what i'd love to do man is come back to this after you finish your next event. So the 30 marathons, finish it in December. Like I know December is a busy month, but like December, January, like I record every week, man, like every week. Yeah. So December, January, I'd love to get in and then go through like the step by step, you know, day one, day two, day three, day four, the mental side of it. If you, if you want it, like completely up to you, 100%. It, it would be awesome. man. I think like we do it at like a weekend as well, a bit more, bit more time. And, uh, and yeah, if you're interested, let's do it. 
Yeah, for sure. We will definitely get another chat going again, 100%.